into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no. It never feels normal calling you people the damned. Um, <laughs> it's their preferred title. Hello, listeners. Uh, this is Bunch Jake. of goth kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me. Um, the damned. Welcome to the show this week. I'm melting. It's very hot in New York. My cat threw up on the floor. Um, what else is going on? In the news it was this week? it was really dry too. Those are the main it was like stories. Stuck this week. on the floor. Yeah, the, uh, it's so hot that my cat threw up, and then the vomit turned back into dry cat food. But this is one of those situations where a rug is really going to hold you back, and you really came out on top. Yeah, I feel good. I feel like I made a good decision to when <laughs> I installed these hardwood floors, which I didn't do. Um, anyways, it's hot, it's, hot, it's, hot, it's so hot a goddamn cat will throw up here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, <laughs> Kevin Spacey it's a from saying. House of Cards. It's a saying. <laughs> I'm yes ending this. <laughs> it's the Tennessee Williams play. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess uh, first and foremost, we should pour one out for uh, Big Dick John McCain. Rest in uh, pieces of broken airplane. Rip to a real one. <laughs> <laughs> he finally died the other day. McCain has been dying for like a year and a half. It's crazy. And that's performance art by that point, too. Yeah. Which really opens you up to a whole new element of criticism. Yeah, we were arguing about John McCain for almost as long as the 2016 primary. I feel like... <laughs> that can't be true. He was like... It's like a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I moved, when I left Austin to, co- to go to New York and to, to do stand-up, I had like a victory lap that lasted like almost a full year. Cause I kept pushing back moving. And it was so much fun being the guy that was about to leave town <laughs> that I almost didn't leave. And I feel like that's what McCain was doing for like the last year. He was just like, come on, let me just party a little bit more. Let me just get a little bit more out of let this. call you know? my wife the C word in front of the press. <laughs> yeah. On top of the world. Yeah. Um, He's like someone who's easy to hate for his war crimes, but then more fun to hate for just his uh, eccentric old white personality. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I guess I should introduce everyone. Uh, I'm Jake Flores. I have with me Alex Patek. I'm Jake Flores. <laughs> and Rog of Meta. I'm Rog of Meta. And our guest uh, calling in from uh, San Francisco is um, comedian Nato Green. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Hey, Nato. Hi. How what? are you? What? How are you taking John's loss or the loss of John McCain? Oh, man, I'm just relieved, like that we're at the beginning of the end of McCain related bullshit like more so than any other Republican people are like in a hurry to give him the benefit of the doubt so like if he does anything ever that's like you know to the left of Strom Thurmond people are like <laughs> oh my god he's a hero he's a dignit like just all of the stuff about the dignity of the office and the you know the, the the like glossy sentimentality about public service uh like and you know his his family's long history of sacrifice for the nation it's just like oh it all makes me sick yeah he's something that's exciting to me about having a generation of politicians who like that where there's a because of uh the chain like the end of the draft and all that kind of stuff that we're going to have a a, a generation like we're at the end of the generation of politicians who are just coasting on military service yeah he's like um and and also it almost seems like liberals love him more than republicans nowadays he's kind of like the jingoistic liberal statue they can all gather around and like feel like they have some sort of a service cred it's weird they like him 
and hate Bernie Sanders. You know what I mean? Like they hate people to the left of themselves and like him, but are like self-professed leftists. It makes no fucking sense. It's almost like it's a party of a establishment supporting uh, people who really just benefit from the status quo, and anything slightly shaking it up upsets them. But they just don't want to openly call people slurs in public. Yeah. He had one thing. It was with Russ Feingold, the campaign finance reform bill that went nowhere, and then he never did anything after that <laughs> yeah it also yeah that didn't work yeah it failed like it was dead on arrival and then he never made an attempt to fix things ever again you know my favorite thing about mccain was is that he called people gooks and then someone asked him about it and was like are you gonna keep calling people gooks <laughs> and he was like yes and i'm not gonna stop <laughs> and then it just that was the end of the story oh shit we love that <laughs> <laughs> it just like <laughs> no one ever asked him about that again, and then he continued to be called, like, all this, you know, heroic, like, uh, you know, he, he was a fucking example of human dignity and all this shit. Um, and he voted with Trump 83% of the time. I checked. More than it was, like, predicted by, you know, this poll. Was that him or the brain tumor, though? <laughs> That's you true. Know. About the same as Jeff Flake, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Complete fucking madness. So we're going to miss the guy. <laughs> um, um, buy your shirts now. One thing that kind of made me laugh this week about him dying uh, was that, um, you know, AOC and Bernie, you know, tweeted some bullshit like, you know, rest in peace, condolences to his family. He was uh, pretty cool or some shit. John and McCain was a true pog. And all the, uh, like, super hardcore leftist Twitter accounts with, you know, the no names and faces and the little hammer and sickles and shit going on are, yeah. like, so furious that Bernie didn't just, like, <laughs> dunk on him. <laughs> 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 like, what was he going to do, you know? Yeah, Enjoy the, the grave, bitch. <laughs> yeah, the rest in peace. <laughs> You've been burned. Yeah, the third world Maoist Twitter uh, was outraged. Like, how could you not corn cop him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so funny to imagine, like, yeah, what if he posted, like, a butterfly guy meme of, t you know, McCain, like, is this being alive or something? <laughs> I mean, that, I agree that would be awesome. Awesome, but he's not going to do that <laughs> shit, you know? Yeah, I mean, any politician who's um, aiming for a national spotlight or has a national platform um, like Bernie, like potentially Ocasio-Cortez, uh, you have to, you know, make those concessions. Here's what they're going to have to do is they have to wait till left podcasts become bigger than the mainstream media and then spend all of their time dunking on dead Republicans. <laughs> Yeah, you know. That's the, full praxis. The future. Uh, Mao the said that. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the next stage in the story is the, like, Meghan McCain, Chelsea Clinton, like, you know, bosom buddy friendship. <laughs> you know, where they, where they write a book together and do a tour about, like, learning to have a deep and abiding friendship across political differences. Yeah. You know, shared by... Uh, you know, united uh, around being millionaires. <laughs> yeah, right. That one unspoken detail that you have a fuck ton of money. They're Frack gonna fracking brought our families together. <laughs> they're gonna run on a never Trump ticket together, and their uh, slogan is just gonna be like, "Why not read a book?" <laughs> <laughs> Megan McCain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm excited for them to both be president. <laughs> um, other news, less political. Um, well, pretty political but more specific to our world. Um, Louis C.K. is just back. Uh, One hero gone, another hero returns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, he's back from, uh, you know. Crashing his plane into the land of <laughs> indecent exposure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Louis performed at the Comedy Cellar a couple nights ago, apparently. And um, last night was it last night? Last night at 10 p.m. Man, yeah, I woke up and he was trending. I'm like, did Louis C.K. die? You know what's so fucking funny about this is that like, okay, so like, and by the way, I feel like I should sometimes uh, do a little um, little asterisk when I talk about certain shit on this show. The views expressed by me are only me and et cetera, because uh, I know this is, uh, is going to be kind of dicey. But love um, you, comedy seller. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay, so like a week ago. Uh, T.J. Miller got booked at the Creek in the Cave, which is this alt comedy club here in New York. It's in Long Island City. It's a fucking annoying train ride away. 
Um, it doesn't pay, you know. <laughs> Another covetous basement <laughs> in New York comedy. <laughs> so somebody was like, hey, holy shit, they booked T.J. Miller at the Creek of the Cave. And then everybody was kind of like, oh, we should boycott the Creek of the Cave. And I heard that, and I was like, hell yeah, let's boycott the Creek of the Cave. Mostly because it's just it's off the G train. Right? It's easy to boycott. Very inconvenient. <laughs> that train shuts down and books rapists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I, I got, 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 kind of got on board with that shit. Then yesterday, I find out Louis C.K. got booked at the Comedy Cellar. I got an email from the Comedy Cellar. <laughs> they sent them a tape and they called me back. It's really hard to get into the Comedy Cellar, so I probably won't get in the Comedy Cellar. But, you know... I mean, this really does make you ask yourself, like, oh, what are, what's, do I actually have integrity here, you know? Man, when did Jake turn to the wrong <laughs> side of history? I'm we s- have the exact moment <laughs> when he I- replied to the email. I'm certain I'm not going to get past the comedy seller. I can't wait to see your new act. It's just like, <laughs> I fucking jack off my kids. I and, fucking. <laughs> and people who have gotten past it, the comedy seller have been punished for far Less like I mean, Emily Heller earlier today tweeted like I ran the light at the comedy cellar once and now I'm banned. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. You know, a friend of mine just got passed at the comedy cellar and he said like Aziz hangs out there all the time and still does spots and shit. Oh. No, that's Randy. Right. <laughs> Randy's at the comedy cellar. Yeah. He's fine. <laughs> he has right. a lot to talk about with Louis. <laughs> I feel like Randy would have been the person that. Aziz is when he has sex, though. <laughs> he does the voice and everything. <laughs> he would be the type of person to do, like, the claw and all that shit. Uh-oh! <laughs> we're in the splash zone! <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'm gonna... <laughs> I- Ian Fidance got passed at the cellar, and he told me that he's been waiting. He's hanging out at the bar, and he's waiting for, um, for Aziz to order, it like, a seltzer so he can go up behind him and go, Ah, uh, me too! <laughs> <laughs> Right behind him? I think it's a good bit. That sounds like an Ian joke. Yeah, it <laughs> definitely is. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, that's fucking weird. Um, not a good move, I don't think. Louis coming back? He didn't even really apologize? No. <laughs> he didn't. He, he made no uh, no real apology, uh, apologies to his victims. Didn't, you know, compensate. Uh, he d- took d- a long vacation. Yeah, yeah, did not uh, give any um, money to charities or anything or, like, reflect on it publicly. And then, um, you know, you think because he's such, like, a raw dude who's so introspective that uh, he would talk about it in his set. But I think I think the New York Times article was like, yeah, he talked about uh, pizza and classic Louis <laughs> stuff. That's, I'm dying to know what's in the set. I gotta know. <laughs> I'll pull it up in a second. That is fucking wild. He's got to have a throwaway line about just like, if there's any women here, turn around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know how Louis sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you guys all think he'd come back so soon? NATO, did you think he'd come back so soon? Uh, I... I didn't. I wasn't thinking in terms of like the amount of time. Um, I, th- I I thought that whatever the return was was going to involve something that he would turn up in a different way that wasn't just like him walking on stage to a fucking standing ovation. Um, it would have been smarter if he like became a behind the scenes guy. Like, like yeah, or like stuff or you something. know, or I mean. You know, the last thing that we heard from him was like, I'm going to go away and listen for a while. You know, that was the last thing he said. And it's like, all right, motherfucker, what did you hear? You know, (laughs) time for a report back. Uh, Not hearing enough laughs. It's like he went away and then he thought about it and he came back and he was like, I have decided I have done nothing wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Did you guys forget? Uh, (laughs) i would like to be on saturday night live again please thank you uh oh the okay i pulled it up the uh i believe this is from the the owner of the comedy cellar says uh typical louis ck stuff racism waitresses tips and parades Uh, (laughs) (laughs) parades like classic louis ck stuff yeah not apology tours parades (laughs) fucking wild yeah i would have thought he would have come back like uh hidden in kind of like the the fred durst fashion like he's like a director now he directs like music videos and like commercials and shit and like bad movies (laughs) you know he's around but my favorite thing in the new york times article was the owner of the comedy seller saying that he thought audiences should decide instead of the like 
instead of the gatekeepers. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> mm-hmm. And so it's yeah. like, like the level of self delusion about anything about how show business works. You know, <laughs> like that it's not all gatekeepers uh, was like incredible to me. So it's, you know, so I just felt like, oh, the audience could decide. Well, then. Where's my Louis deal on FX? Notoriously great arbiters of taste, the audience. (laughs) The free market of laughs. You know how they're they're very deliberate about attending comedy (laughs) shows? Yeah. That's also like, yeah, they get barked in. They're fucking whoever. But also, it's like spoken like somebody who's like, he clearly knows the only thing he's got going for him is that he can make rando ass comedy club audiences laugh. So like now he's like, well, I think these people. Or have great opinions on things because <laughs> they like me. The comedians don't. You could go up and just do the Tim Allen growl, and they'd be like, "He's back." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's like saying, like, you know, I'm a carpenter, so I think the nails are the thing. I don't. I don't know. It's fucking weird. It's just you know, it's like it's transparent. Like nails. It's like nails. It's, it's like a, a metaphor like that nails. I just made that didn't make any sense. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, we'll see what the fuck goes on. When you on hold there. your dick like the hammer, the whole world's a nail. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I'll report back and see if I get into the comedy cellar, and then I'll destroy it from the inside oh, like a praxis. rogue agent by bombing as hard <laughs> as possible on purpose at the comedy cellar. If you see Jake bomb, it's on purpose. <laughs> yeah, it's actually political action. I'm I an do activist. the same thing. I it's, do the exact same thing. It's now, for women. I'm doing it for women. You're going to bomb, and you're like, now this is indecent exposure. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, so that's, I don't know, that's the goings on of the week. But I guess without further ado, we should uh, get to our guest. Uh, yeah, Nato Green, uh, comedian from San Francisco and uh, union negotiator. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, union organizer, union negotiator, whatever. Okay, how long, like, how did you, can you take us through how you got involved in that? Did you, you were doing that before comedy, correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I I did a little bit of comedy in college, but mostly uh, I, don't, I sort of I don't count that time as my comedy time. You would argue um, for more drink tickets. Well, no, it was <laughs> like, you know, I was uh, I had a friend whose dad was the manager of the Comedy Underground in Seattle. And so we went up and did a few open mics and I was horrible and couldn't wasn't didn't have the confidence to like do the thing that you do when you start comedy and suck for a while before you got good. So then I stopped. Uh, but basically, um, when I graduated from college, I knew I wanted to be in the labor movement and, um, uh, and specifically that I wanted to organize young workers and no one was doing that. People were like, young workers are unorganizable. And so I was like, I'll show you. They're and on then razor I, scooters. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean that like, w- Typically, I mean, this, this, there's been a version of this with every new group of workers who hasn't been organized before is until they're organized, people are like these, gr- these workers are inherently unorganizable, whether it's women or immigrants or black people or young people or whatever. People are always like, these people, the new people are unorganizable. Unions are for, like, men in hard hats. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you have to be able to catcall to get into the union. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, last night I have a I, in San Francisco. I have a movie riffing show where we talk where we talk over the movies, and um, uh, so last night the movie was Flashdance, and like I couldn't separate. You know, it, I had, couldn't experience the movie as anything other than a story about deindustrialization of America. <laughs> um, so, because she's a welder. Oh um, yeah. Fuck. I had that with a, with a movie I watched a while back. It's a movie where Tom Hanks inherits like a really nice house, and he's furious about it because it's falling apart. I went over to my friend's house who's a comic, and he's a normal person who doesn't think about this shit all day, and I was just furious at this fucking movie. <laughs> I had to like leave. He was like, this isn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> what movie is this where so, Tom Hanks that lets a house fall apart? I'm trying to look it up right now. Okay. I'll come is back it to the it. Burbs? <laughs> nah. Is this- it's like him and Saving a woman. Saving Private Ryan? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'll come back to it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, it's Philadelphia. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, um, so I like I wanted to organize young workers. I wanted to organize people who were like myself, and and the existing unions were like, well, we don't want to organize young people 
um, uh, you know, what the way that we're going to reach young people is by making this snappy rap video about the importance of the labor movement. <laughs> and I was like, I don't think that's going to cut it, you guys. So um, I was what's called a salter. Have you heard of that term? It's somebody who gets non-union jobs in order to organize them. Oh, uh, yeah. Louis C.K. has been uh, accused of being one of those. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, uh, I was fucking around. So I, uh, I got a job at, uh, at Noah's Bagels, a subsidiary of Einstein Brothers Bagels, which you may be familiar with. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, just got a job as a counterperson and organized a union there and got fired. And then I got some other job in a grocery store and tried to organize a union unsuccessfully. And then... I got a job as a car messenger and organized a union of biking car messengers in San Francisco, which was a, like uh, some amount of a success. Um, and then I raised a bunch of foundation money and started the country's first worker center for young and immigrant workers in the low wage service sector in San Francisco. And in 2003, sponsor, we were part of a coalition that drafted the first local minimum wage initiative um, that passed and sort of was the the, the deepest precursor to like the the current fight for 15 stuff can, um, can i just ask because the, this is incredible what is it what is it like succeeding in unionizing a workplace i don't know anyone who's done it do people thank you are they excited yeah they make oh you cake. i mean so okay so let i mean let me uh it, it's it's visceral so like you know i, I when i organize a bike and car messengers we um that's a, such a great question no one's ever asked that um the like you know it's bike and car messenger work at the time you know was like deep in the underground economy you know what i mean like a lot of people you know there were a lot of addicts a lot of people uh, you know coming off of welfare or out of jail or um you know immigrants or people who were like otherwise living on the edge a lot of punk rock bike messengers i'm a bike messenger and they all have podcasts um and i live on the edge uh you know and like when we were organizing um you know i got i got threatened like there were you know managers you know threatened to beat me up and stuff and but when we you know when i was first working as a messenger um you know i was we the the it was a commission system where we were paid illegally and so i wasn't i didn't get overtime didn't get minimum wage didn't get lunch breaks worked 12 to 14 hours a day driving unsafe trucks like that had, you know, the, the headlights were out and cracked windshields and bald tires and driving, you know, 600 miles on a on an emergency donut tire and stuff like that. And not as glamorous um, as the truck work you see on TV. Mm -hmm. Over right, the top. Totally. With, uh, and then Stallone. And then like after we organized and when we got our first union contract, um, I mean, the thing that I really remember feeling was winning lunch breaks. Um, and, you know, before you would like have to sneak food and, you know, you're, the dispatcher would be yelling at you on the radio, like, where the fuck are you do this delivery? Like, and you'd be like, I'm sorry, I just need to, you know, Oh my God. And like being, being able to be like, I'm going to sit down and it, I'm, I get a 30 minute lunch break right now is like, like, it, I, like I, it was my sandwich meant something to me. You, get you know to what I mean? It was like, victory. just yeah, bite like, right into it. They, it was like. It was like I got to enjoy my lunch break partly because it was something that I won. You know what I mean? It was something that we fought for and won. And there were all these dudes who, you know, like when because of the nature of messenger work is that the delivery like has to be done. You know, the whole the whole thing is urgency. And so like there were deliveries that had to be done, you know, within a matter of like a couple hours. And so we were um, we struck a lot. Uh, we had 20 strikes in a year and a half. And so it was the kind of thing where, like, if they fired somebody, everybody would just w walk off. We, you know, we'd turn our radios off, and we'd tell the boss, we'll, come, we'll turn our radios back on when this dude is rehired. And usually we would get the dude rehired within an hour and a half. That's amazing. And so yeah. it was like, I mean, that's the other thing that, you, that you, you really feel is, like, the, the level of job security that's possible where it doesn't matter whether or not your boss hates you. Like, even if your boss hates you to know that they can't do anything to you because your coworkers will have your back – uh, that it's there's no lawyers involved. There's no like waiting for a judge to make a decision. You just know that if they fuck with you, everything's getting shut down. That's a level of sen uh, like a feeling of security that is not like any other kind of security, and that is you know way better and may way more real than like having to grovel and suck up to your boss and worried about what they might be thinking. Well, so I, you you said you were working with uh, younger people, messengers, uh, former addicts. 
Uh, and, you know, the influence of labor in America has decreased so dramatically over the last few decades, at least in the last century. Um, what was, like, the initial response you got from workers when you started to approach them about this? Were they particularly cynical? Were they skeptical? Because I imagine if, like, I, you know, I worked in the service industry. If anyone talked to me about that stuff, I would blow them off just because I, I was just so deeply cynical about my uh, standard of living and my future. Um, yeah, well, so, like, the, the, the union that if young people are come in contact with a union at all, uh, mostly the union that they're most likely to come in contact with is like a grocery workers union because like a lot of grocery workers are unionized and so like getting a getting a job as a you know as a bagger at the at a supermarket chain is a way to get into a, a union job and I actually in the course of this you know I had a summer job in college um, at like this touristy sourdough bread cafe in San Francisco where I was a union member and it was a horrible experience because the union didn't give a shit about us and. You know, and the union, like, it was a summer job, and literally, like, the union initiation fees would have eaten up half my summer earnings. And I was like, I can't afford this. And the union guy was like, well, but then you can have a career working at Safeway and Albertsons. And I was like, motherfucker, I'm in college. I'm not trying to build a career at Safeway and Albertsons. And so, like, basically, the, you know, the big insight that, that I had that led to, the, like, the, the, the light bulb that went off that led to me building my own organization was like going back to basics of political economy, which is that it's not, it's not that, you know, the reason that young people weren't involved in unions wasn't a lack of interest or that they, that they accepted the conditions of their exploitation or they didn't care. It was because the kinds of jobs that they had uh, were not the kinds of jobs that unions knew how to organize. Like everybody has issues. Everybody is willing, is potentially willing to organize if you, are able to talk, articulate a strategy and a vision to resolve their conditions that make some sense to them. But like what I found with young people is that, you know, the the way that unions were talking to people is like we, we want you to have a job that you, you know, unions talk to people in terms of jobs that like you're going to be in this one job for 20 years and you're going to have a pension. And most young people aren't thinking that way. Most young workers are thinking about like uh, Snapchat. You know, it, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, in those days, this was 20 years ago, so Snapchat wasn't invented yet. But uh, it was like a lot of um, like lateral mobility. What, like I, I started talking, I started talking about the idea of economic adolescence, that there were just weren't enough good jobs to go around, and so like there was this stereotype that that like you didn't rate at the time you didn't need to raise the minimum wage because you, the minimum wage benefited young people working in fast food who didn't didn't need the money and were just you know uh working to get be able to have enough money to buy CDs which were these things that we used to have to listen to music um and like the you know CDs. and what we discovered is that youth poverty rates were really high and young people desperately needed the money and young people were hobbled by student debt and had aspirations to get out of low wage service sector jobs but couldn't and so we're stuck in this revolving door between like you know community college and debt and service sector jobs and you know i'm going to go work at starbucks and then uh, you know if i'm lucky i'm going to get a tipped work tipped job at the olive garden you know and like people move around that way you're telling me uh, but they stay within the service sector for the anti-minimum wage rhetoric was mostly just bullshit made up to keep people from earning more money <laughs> i know it's that shocking. reminds me of um, um I, I grew up in uh i grew up in houston but i went to college and dropped out of ut in austin i just remember like when i was working and trying to get like get my life together every fucking job in that town because it was a college town was some minimum wage bullshit and it would always be like perfect for college students and you go why and they'd be like because we're not going to pay you very much money <laughs> they love not having money and yeah. being treated like dogs yeah it's like well <laughs> wouldn't a, wouldn't a job that pays more money be more perfect for a college student like don't you see they own tens of thousands of dollars to <laughs> mysterious private entities they need to not have money yeah it was insane if you listen to stand up from like the 90s i've definitely heard dana gould do a whole chunk on like 
uh, Rage Against the Machine crust punks asking for money on the street or asking yeah. for a higher minimum wage. And you can tell back then the culture was just, like, very condescending. Yeah, there were a lot of, like, uh, God, there was this comic in Austin whose punchline was just like, eh, shut up and scoop my fucking ice cream or whatever. And then the audience would be like, woo, yeah! Woo, you scoop know? it! <laughs> it was very, a very lame cultural we'll norm. Ice cream. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we, we, used, we used to talk to people about this. Old, there was this Chris Rock joke from early in his career about the minimum wage. Uh, where he says uh, the minimum wage is your boss boss's way of saying I would pay you less if yeah. I could. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The only thing keeping me from paying you la- paying you nothing is the law. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the government has to come in here, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, physically well, stop me. Well, and it's like it. You know, we live here in New York. We go to fast food places. We see people with some mean workers all the time, and it's so dispiriting because most of the people who work those jobs are young people. Um, you know ex-felons or felons i guess uh maybe uh disabled people mentally challenged people and it, we're we're literally um punishing f- like furthermore the least powerful people in society yeah and continuing to and it's interesting how it perpetuates itself that was a really good question uh because i, I know people have st- tried to start unions before and th- what you you often are uh met with resistance from other workers for strange reasons, like myths that they've sort of been led to believe about why you shouldn't unionize. About their job security. Yeah, yeah. or actual sort of weird fucked up ways in which, you know, the, their practical safety does get challenged by the concept of forming a union, which is a bad thing. It's scary to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You put at least your own job at risk. Um, NATO, if you don't mind me asking, what is like the scariest <laughs> repercussion you've had from trying to unionize? Obviously, losing your job would be the worst one. Um... The scariest. Um, uh, you know, I, I was never that afraid for myself. Um, you know, there. I mean, certainly there have been times where, um, uh, I mean, the, well, let me put it this way. The times that people got most upset at me was later on, like where, where you know, uh, later on when um, I, at some point I went to work for the nurses union and uh, I, so I was on, at that point on staff, and I was a union rep. And um, you know, n- like nurses will go on strikes, but on strike, and nurses' strikes are incredible. But frequently, hospitals will hire like fucking Blackwater security to shuttle the scabs across the picket line. Oh my god! Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ! So Some fucking Halo like, guy next to you. <laughs> yeah. So like that stuff. That stuff gets hairy. Like you know, and they're like. Actually, so I got hired as a union rep by the by the nurses, and they assigned me to this to be the rep at this hospital. And then again, if you so get I was hurt, you are at the hospital, <laughs> right? Yeah, fortunately. <laughs> well, yeah. Although this was a birthing hospital, so it's like, well, if well we'll give you a born. C-section. <laughs> you know, um, so the um, so I was representing the nurses, and at the time, the other union that represented like all the all the non nursing hospital staff, like the housekeeping and the cafeteria workers and the nurses aides and all those people and the LVNs, they were on strike. And so I go into the hospital to talk to the nurses and the security was on such high alert that they like literally chased me up and down the stairwells of the hospital and ultimately cornered me in a break room and had security guards stand outside the break room that I was trapped in, film the door from the outside. They like filmed the videotaped the closed door that I was behind uh, it, while they called the police to have me arrested for trespassing uh, in a hospital that I was supposed to be at because I was the union rep. Wow. Jeez. Damn. Um, there's got to be like, so, I know there's no union laws left, but there's got to be something on the books for that, right? Like, you, that's your job. Right. Well, um, you know, ulti- I mean, ultimately the thing went away. It's like if a hospital calls the police to arrest someone for trespassing, you can get arrested. You're not going to get convicted of anything. You're going to be in prison um, someday? Like like what are you in for? You know, it'll just be inconvenient for your right. day, for sure. <laughs> right. It's just, It's just. you know, it's like, I mean, it was, I mean, some of this stuff goes back to like, you know, the Palmer raids in COINTELPRO, right? It's just about harassment. It's not about the long-term outcome, you know? Um, so, uh, and so, you know, when I was, when I was working with the nurses, um, the hospital chain that we were dealing with was called Sutter Health, and they were trying to get approvals for 
like uh, like it was like the gentrification of hospitals. They were trying to close hospitals in poor neighborhoods and build like a deluxe fancy destination hospital for rich people, <laughs> um, and also bust the union and destroy some rent controlled housing at the same time. It's like a big nightmare. And so it was like it was a two billion dollar development project that they were trying to get approval from for the city. And I helped build this labor community coalition that actually blocked the project. That and people got they got so upset. At one point, the Episcopal Archbishop of California called me the. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that fucking rules. So I hope you that go over well uh, with the damned. Our <laughs> podcast yeah. audience, it's all goth socialists. So, They've all been called the Antichrist. Uh, yeah, so you know, and because like, w- but we, but we won actually. Like, we, you know, they wanted to close this hospital. Um, who like ninety percent of their patient population was Medicaid patients, and ultimately, like after blocking this development politically for almost 10 years, the hospital ultimately agreed to a nationally unprecedented set of community benefits, including spending $300 million that they didn't plan to spend rebuilding this hospital oh, in the cool. neighborhood. Um, I have a question. You said you worked as a salter, um, which is the role of uh, the character Squeeze in Sorry to Bother You, um, yes. which you appear in, by the way. Which I appear in. Did Correct. you know that? Did you know you appear in that movie? <laughs> um, uh, how did you feel about uh, the portrayal of Squeeze? Are you the one from Atlanta? The show Atlanta? Uh, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I wasn't the one from Atlanta. I was, uh, um, uh, although I, Danny Glover's in it, and I went to junior high with his daughter. Whoa. Um, Whoa. In, some, in some deep San Francisco business. Um, so, but... Uh, yeah, I actually like I tweeted a th- like a thread of commentary about Squeeze Squeeze's organizing work. Um and uh the so I thought he was good at some things and not good at other th- other things at, in that role. What he was good at was moving workers to confrontation pretty quickly. Um that like the most important thing about organizing the biggest hurdle is that people ultimately need to confront their own boss. And nothing is scarier than that. Uh, that you know, nothing is scarier than than direct confrontation with the person who decides whether or not you're going to be able to afford food that month. Um, and you know, usually in my experience, every time you try to organize workers, that's like not the first thing that they want to do. Usually, it's like, can we call lawyers? Can we call the media? Can you know, like this? Can we call that? Th- there's a, there's always a, can we call politicians? That they want someone else, like some elite to solve the problem for them um that that's the hope but but, and so the quicker that workers get to the point of taking matters into their own hands and having real confrontation uh the better as an organizer like you know if there's not a confrontation you need to figure out how to provoke one that's the job so like that 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 squeeze did that i thought was really great the thing that i didn't like that squeeze did as an organizer was that he talked too much um that like you know, the organizer's job, the salter's job is, is to listen more than to talk. And he, Squeeze did too much of the stuff for people. Like He did kind of seem mo- a little unlikable in that he was a little into himself in the movie. Uh, I thought yeah, that, I mean. he has sex with the protagonist's girlfriend. <laughs> that's also true. <laughs> uh, but I mean, in, in, in a way, it's like all that stuff is realistic to me. Like I've known organizers like that. You know, like there are certainly these like fucking testosterone junkie, hot-headed organizers who are like really into their egos and you know where it's like a big macho thing to to come in and swing your dick around and like solve you know and show people how like militant you are like that's a thing that exists it's not good organizing but it's a it's a truthful portrayal um you know but for example like you know if it were me i would never be the person like even if i were the 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 organizer the person in the moment who calls like phones down you know what i mean like i would have if I'm the organizer, I'm talking to the workers and saying, getting one of them to do it. Because I'm going to leave, right? And the workers need to be, be need to right. have experience with doing this stuff on their own after I go away. And so I always want to make sure, like, that I'm not the one on the bullhorn. I'm not the one giving the speeches. I'm not the one calling, you know, now we put phones down and call, be doing the actions. Right, that's, right. Not, that's not my role. Workers, workers need to, you know, people, people who, the organizers that I work with get tired of me using this phrase, but... I believe that people need to be the architects of their own liberation. Oh, Ooh, that's man. cool to I say. Like yeah. 
Gonna people, you know, spread your red terror across the office. <laughs> uh-huh. I've, been, I've been sitting on a joke about Danny Glover's daughter saying, "I'm getting too young for this shit." God damn it! For the last <laughs> ten minutes, because she's a young person and not an old person. It's hard to organize young people. I've heard. <laughs> yeah, it was weird though. She was really old. We were in junior high, but she was like fifty. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just think about quitting junior high. <laughs> One more class. Just when I'm out, they drag me back in. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, um so wh- what what are you what are you working on now in San Francisco actively? Um so the 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 at at this second I'm sort of uh between missions. Um the I was just got I recently got back from being spending 6 months in Cuba. Um and before I went to Cuba the last thing that I spent the last several, several years doing was organizing adjunct college professors. Um, there's been a national movement to organize adjunct college professors. So for people who don't know, these are prof- college professors who are hired and paid course by course. So instead of having a salary, they get paid sometimes 3000 sometimes 5000 occasionally more than that. You know, occasionally as much as eight or nine thousand dollars per class. You know what I so, love is when my teacher is freelancing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I always right. want to get the best education. Yeah. Just coasting. Um, yeah, right. And so now, like, you know, forty years ago, uh, like seventy percent of college faculty were tenured full time professors. Now it's flipped, and like seventy percent of college faculty nationally is are these adjuncts who have no job security, no benefits, no pension. Adjuncts talk about freeway flyers, people who like try to stitch together a full time job out of like teaching at a bunch of different schools at the same time. Um, You know, there's all this stuff about like, you know, that people literally don't know from one semester semester to the next uh, if they're going to be able to keep teaching. Then, you know, if if the school's going to have them back, there's no commitment. In like Um, a mean spirited way, it does make me a little happy as a millennial that uh, uh, 50 year old PhDs are now fully in the gig economy. Yeah, they're also trying to write for some e cards and shit, (laughs) and they are not going to beat me. (laughs) I'm really good at wine jokes. (laughs) So, um, so that's been, you know, that's been, and like there have been stories about adjuncts like going bankrupt and being homeless because, you know, people with PhDs because they don't have enough job security. And so nationally, the Service Employees International Union has, SEIU has done a whole program to organize adjuncts. And then we, we, we've organized about 50,000 adjuncts across the country. In the Bay Area, um, I helped organize 1,700 professors at seven private nonprofit colleges and then I negotiated the first their first union contracts and I'm proud to say uh, they were some of the best contracts in the country for adjunct professors like in some at the high end in some cases we won people uh, 50 and 60 percent raises oh that's amazing Um, and as well as job security like people for the first time in their careers had real job security from semester to semester Um, so uh, and you know what what they described was that they had uh um that these workers who were like so isolated and alone because of the conditions of their employment that the process of unionization actually created a sense of community that in their work that they never had before um one one highlight of that is that uh it turned out that the art schools were more resistant to unionizing um cuz like you know you would like we need job security for these art schools and then the, then the administrators of the art schools would be like, we, how could we possibly write in a union contract? Art is subjective. Like, what if a genius shows up and wants to teach here tomorrow? We can't commit to you. And so it's just like, so like the faculty, because we're art schools, like, you know, were designing their own propaganda. And it was bananas, like having professors of graphic design being like l- reviewing the union's, you know, literature and being like, you know, I really don't like the the serif font that you're using on the campaign <laughs> flyer. <laughs> um, oh, man. So, I went and I'm just going to mock up something that is like repurposing this, you know, 1978 cover of Art Forum magazine <laughs> to like be a pro-union message, if that's okay. You know. Yeah. Can we uh, use floral patterns All on bickering this? on the flyers. Oh, my God. Let us ask ourselves, what is money? <laughs> I do feel like creatives and artists in general are the most victim to kind of like – uh, uh, s- what's the word? Uh, so like, the mindset of not deserving money. 
Oh. Yeah. You know, like, like they're the hardest to trick into. Like they embrace their suffering. Embracing yeah. a union or like. Sure. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the good point you made about that, uh, the, the genius thing, though, because they also tend to believe in that, like, uh, you know, that sort of mythos, and the, the the idea of once in a long time, a, like an exceptional person coming along. It's a good substitute for money, believing that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it runs, you know, completely counterintuitive to, you know, anything that's across the board and for everyone. Um, it's kind of silly. Um, the, the Tom Hanks movie I was trying to think of earlier is The Money Pit. All right? Oh, of course. course. It's from 1986. <laughs> oh. uh, young lovers Tom Hanks and Anna, or I'm sorry, Walter, Tom Hanks, and Anna Shelley Long are house sitting in the New York City apartment owned by Max and his ex-husband who suddenly decides to toss them out. Needing a, few, uh, a new home, they settle on buying a country estate outside the city, which is available for a suspiciously low price. It soon becomes apparent why, as the doors fall off their hinges, staircases come tumbling down, and a bathtub falls through the floor. So they, like, they buy this huge house for, like, uh, you know, for, like, really cheap. They're like, oh, my God, why is it so cheap? And then the punchline of the movie is them finding out, it's so cheap because it's falling apart. But it's know. haunted, right? No, it's just this shitty house. It's just got some holes build. in it. <laughs> Awful. I would kill for that house. I got so mad watching this movie because I was like, <laughs> give it to me. I'll just buy it. Just fix the floor. I'll just live in it, and it's, like, insanely huge for two people to live in. That's how good the housing market was in the late 80s. <laughs> do, you, do you ever do, do the thing of like watching older movies with, with, with Zillow open? <laughs> uh, <laughs> like it's fun, it's fun to watch a movie like Training Day and just like look up these scenes where Denzel Washington is murdering people in LA and be like Oh, that house is worth four million dollars now. <laughs> <laughs> well, because Denzel Washington was in it. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so uh, wrapping up here. Um, well, we I, I was going to transition into Costa Hawkins from the Money Pit. I thought that was a brilliant uh, oh, uh, yeah. segue. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> the nickname for Costa Hawkins. I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask you a little bit about Costa Hawkins because I uh, I read a little bit of writing about it, and I just got back from California where it was sort of a uh, a topic on everyone's mind. Um, can you explain to us a little bit about uh, what Costa Hawkins is? Yeah. So um, in 1995, the state passed a law uh, called Costa Hawkins, um, named obviously after Bob Costas and Stephen J. Hawkins. Mm-hmm, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, actually, so the, the, it was sponsored by a state legislator, um, Cost, Costa, who now is a fucking congressman and a Democrat. So this is... Our, our rent control problem in California was inflicted upon us by a Democratic politician. Um, and uh, it was that there, there had been, in the late 70s and through the 80s, there were a bunch of local rent control uh, campaigns that were successful at creating rent control. Um, the thing that really terrified the real estate industry was the idea of vacancy control, that you wouldn't just limit how much landlords could raise rent on people who are renting a place, but... Like, if I'm renting a place and then I leave, uh, you know, it, it used to be that, like, landlords want to be able to raise the rent to market rate to the new person. And what they were afraid of was vacancy control that would prevent them from, that would maintain the rents between tenants. Um, and so Costa Hawkins was a 1995 state law that limited how much authority local governments had to create rent control. And the things that it pre- prevented were... It, it um, limited the, t- the age of the buildings that could be covered. So uh, post Costa Hawkins, any um, new local rent control law can only af- cover build- buildings built before 1995 unless there was an existing rent control law in those, in those places already. Uh, so like San Francisco passed rent control in 1979, and so rent control only covers pre-1979 buildings. So it's, it's my understanding um, that it created sort of a situation where now people are actively, like, trying to, like, people that are trying to profit off of this are tearing down buildings that would be rent-controlled so that they can now build a new property that's because it's new, can't be rent-controlled? That's right. Yeah. And, yes, and, and it creates, like, it makes rent-controlled housing this, like, scarce and shrinking resource. It, the other thing that Costa Hawkins did, it prevented vacancy control and it prevented covering uh, condominiums and homes. So you would have an apartment building and the landlord would say, we are converting all these apartments to condominiums and now it's no longer rent controlled. Um, so there's been like a whole back and forth fight about what's involved in converting things to condominiums. Um, and 
So in the last several years, like a bunch of communities across the state have passed local rent control um, laws, like Richmond, California, which is where Chevron, there was a big Chevron refinery there. Um, Mountain View down where uh, Google is, like a lot of big tech companies, uh, a lot of towns all over, the, all over California have passed expansions of rent control up to the limit allowed by Costa Hawkins, but it's been a big problem. And when I was writing the column, I looked at the census data and, you know, renting households in California, the household income is about half that of homeowners. Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, fucking renting households tend to be black and brown at a higher degree than homeowners that they, te you know, that there's like this really overwhelming data about um, people being, you know, mortgage burdened, that the, the percentage of people who can't afford their housing are spending greater and greater percentages of their income on housing for renters is going up and up. And so it's like this horrible situation. And so in November, we have a ballot initiative to repeal Costa Hawkins, which will allow local governments to expand rent control more aggressively for the first time since 1995. It's very exciting. I should tell you that I am a landlord. In mm. fact, I own my twist. home. And in my <laughs> twist, in my house, there is a like I bought a house with an in law. I own a giant house that's downstairs. suspiciously cheap just <laughs> outside of town. Uh, right. Uh, well, actually, so my house is what's called an earthquake cottage. It was like, it's like a piece of shit house that was built after the 1906 mm. earthquake. And so, um, but there's an in law apartment. I, I um, you know, rent it out to friends at like way, way below market rate. Um, and so occasionally when like I like I'll show up at hearings and politicians will be like, what about the mom and pop landlords? And, I, and I'll go, I am the mom and pop landlords and I still support rent control. Um, yeah, I like that piece you wrote about the uh, the myths that they're trying to throw at uh, people about Prop 10, like um, that there's some, you know, big uh, movement of uh, mom and pop landlords that are going to be affected by this. You know, those classic American small business landlords, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that are going to suffer at the hand of this, uh, you know, this, this reform or whatever. Me and Ma decided to well, open and the Well, and the big, th the big thing that's changed since 2008 is that Wall Street is now in the, in the, in the rental business. Like, that there are these big private equity companies that are, like, buying up rental properties. So it's like there's, you know, now there's these, like, giant mega holding companies, uh, you know, with names like Trump and Jared Kushner and whatever um, at the top of them that are, like, people's landlords. Um, so the, you know, there's been this, like, the anti-prop, the, the anti-rent control campaign is saying, you know, rent control is an artificial intervention in the economy. It distorts the free market. And really what we need is just to deregulate land use so that we can increase of course. supply. Um, of course. And I'm not, you know, I'm not opposed to increasing supply. That's fine, except that it's also slow. And so, you know, it's like I've read the studies, even on the, like, the best, most optimistic scenarios, these, like, supply-side focused scenarios don't really benefit poor people for 20 years. Um, so... You know, whereas rent control benefits people immediately. In a state with a notorious homeless problem. Right. Yeah. I mean, if, like, you know, whenever somebody may want to, wants to talk to you about the free market, just remind them that there are 800,000 homeless people in America and 25 million vacant homes. Um, I want to go to Skid Row yeah. and explain the plot of the money pit to <laughs> a bunch of people who live in tents. There's these two white people, and they're so sad because they have this huge house. They just got a house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, It's not the way they wanted it. Don't you understand? I'm sorry I fell on your tent. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, just wrapping up here... Um, uh, we, we, you know, we talk, the, the show is about politics. Uh, I, I don't think you've been involved too much electorally at all, but, like, what can, um, because the Democratic Party, uh, you know, as far as involvement with labor has not been great in recent years, um, do you think the Democrats are a proper vehicle for, you know, future labor wins and concessions, um, especially in the upcoming election? If you had any advice to give them, what would that be? I know that's a broad question, but... Oh, yeah. I mean, well, I, I have been involved in politics, you know, locally in San Francisco and in the Bay Area in California. You know, I've, I've worked on every election in San Francisco in the last 20 years. Um, and so, you know, there, there, there is this like this thing that people on the left say, like, I feel like people on the left are like weirdly sentimental about politics. Um, like, 
why don't they know that, you know, Medicare for all will help them win elections? They fucking do know. They don't care because they're millionaires. You know what I mean? Like, right. yeah. it's, you know, op- like Medicare these centrist Democrats are not, s- they're not stupid. They represent their class interests and they would rather lose than betray their class interests. And, you know, it's not we like one of my, you know, I, I do think, um, uh, I do, th- you know, I would love there to be a third party, and I, you know, supported Ralph Nader in 2000, and like support, you know, I'm happy to support, uh, you know, third party candidates in nonpartisan races, but the reality of our first past the post system creates lots of obstacles, and I think the evidence of that is that, like, is you know, is Bernie that the excitement and the dynamism of all everything that Bernie that Bernie has inspired, and as far as he was able to got, get go even in the primary was possible because he was running as a Democrat. Like if he had run outside the democratic party, like we wouldn't have been talking, we wouldn't still be talking about him in the same way. Um, We'd be talking about him like we talk about Jill Stein. Right. Totally. (laughs) Um, So, uh, you know, what I say to people on the left about electoral politics is there is no should, there is no, you know, you don't deserve to win. There's no fairness. It's about power. And the way that you defeat the ruling class is the same as it always is that you outorganize them. And so, like, I, you know, I'm never mad at uh, um, the, you know, at the Democrats for being sellouts because, like, po- you know, as, as uh, Rebecca Solnit says, politicians are weather vanes and it's our job to be the weather. Like, um, and if we haven't done a good job of making the weather, you know, when, when politicians do the right thing, it tells us that it's because we've done a good job of, uh, of being the weather. At, when I was a teenager, my dad came, came to me and he uh, gave me the Mao Zedong essay, essay on practice. Uh, and it was what he assigned me to read. And, we've all been you know, there. I go back to it all. <laughs> we've all, who, who hasn't had a dad like that? <laughs> um, and... You know, I go back to on practice all the time. Knowledge is verified when your actions achieve the intended results. So if you're not achieving the outcome, it means your analysis is wrong and you need to change your analysis. Um, so, and figure out what it is that, why it is that you're losing. Um, the other thing that, you know, that I keep going back to, I'm, I feel like I need to write about this, is, is the, uh, or as it relates to, the, to electoral politics, is this idea of the, uni- the united front. Um, once upon a time, I was in a, in a, a some Marxist uh, book clubs, and we were st- we were studying the the United Front in China of the communists and the nationalists against the Japanese. Um, and what I always tell people about the you know as annoying as the Democratic Party is, at least they're better than Chiang Kai Shek. Um, uh, that <laughs> great you know, slogan for twenty twenty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the you know that part. It, if you don't have the power to win on your own, you need to figure out how to get be in a united front with people to the right of you and who may be Democrats. And what that means is figuring out how to engage in that united front in a way that whether, whatever happens, you emerge from it stronger as the left. That's not, a, that's not a do you or don't you participate in the Democratic Party. That's a how. How do you do it in a way that builds your power and builds your message, regardless of what the outcome is of that specific election? That was a really good answer. Yeah. <laughs> that's also why you can't just be like... Um, all right, I'm Bernie Sanders, and I would just like to say that John McCain is a cuck, and I'm glad he's dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I just like I'm just you know like I it's there's something adorable about how like upset you know people on the left get all the time like you know I just can't bring myself to vote for a Democrat you know I'm not going to do something about what I believe blah 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 it's like fuck your feelings you know what I mean like. This is, I mean, this is this is one of the one of the benefits of praxis. Don't uh, care about your feelings. Yeah, you know, and and <laughs> it's not it's not about being. You know, I don't have any illusions about how fucked up the Democratic Party is. I was in Guatemala into during the 2000 election, and one of the things that Guatemalans said to me is they said, for, for, from the perspective of Guatemala, the only difference between Democrats and Republicans is whether we die by starvation or we get murdered. Um, so. Uh, it's like, all right, good to know. Um, <laughs> to our <laughs> friends in Guatemala. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's very true. I was, that reminds me of something I, I remember telling people a lot during like 2016. People would be like, you know, why are you so mad at Hillary Clinton? And the answer I would give them is because I'm going to vote for her. Like, that's why you should be so angry and, uh, you know, have, you know, so much. Because c- you're editing the fucking people that you're sort of being de facto 
you know, carted into voting for or whatever. That's where the fire it comes from, kind of, you know. The passion comes from Yeah, love. well, and, and if I can play the card of being old man the left for a minute, um, since I am uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Generation X, I'm in my 40s, so I can be old man the left now. Um, <laughs> that, like, How's the job of the left is to be where the masses are. Serious politics is in the millions. And, you know, even though I am intensely critical of a lot of stuff about Hillary Clinton and all of her politics and a lot of the policies that she advocated, a lot of stuff that she represented, there were a lot of people that were excited about her. And if the masses are, you know, our job as the left is to be where the masses are. And if the masses are excited about something and moving on something, even if it's not our agenda, our job is to be out there with those people and figure out how to win them over. Right. Be uh, the weather that pulls them in our direction. I w- I'm just, I'm really be excited the about. underground of weather. I want to become <laughs> a hurricane. I like this metaphor. I like the idea of becoming a storm. <laughs> Very cool. Well, uh, yeah. By the way, the the weather control stuff. If you if you haven't read the 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 Mark and Paul Engler book, this is an uprising. Have you read that? No, I've never no. even heard of it. Uh, uh, it came out. They pub- the the Engler brothers published this book. This is an uprising in 2015, and it sort of after the ele- or maybe yeah, I think it was 2015, maybe early 2016, and then after the election, it sort of became like incredibly significant. You know, it, they were sort of. Uh, uh, it, it it sold out quickly because it was so relevant. But it's it was it's a sort of analysis about nonviolent resistance and how nonviolent resistance movement, movements work. And there's a story that people tell about like, uh, you know about you know the feeling like it always feels like movements come out of nowhere. That suddenly you know nothing is happening and suddenly Occupy Wall Street is spread across the country and we don't understand how it happened. And the Angler book sort of goes through this analysis of the study of nonviolent resistance movements and draws this conclusion that like you can actually, sometimes you can control the weather. Cool. I'm well, inspired uh, now and shit. Yeah, thank you so much. Ever, everyone check out uh, NATO's column. It's in the San Francisco Examiner every week, correct? That's correct. I also, I also have a, a, a new comedy album out, out this year. And what's it called? It's called The Whiteness Album. Oh, I like it. Like the Beatles. <laughs> it's a theme album about the whites. <laughs> Finally. I have, a talk, I have a talk about the whites. Oh, I like it. Well, yeah, check it, check that out. Check out the column. Check out the album. Uh, Nato, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Cool. Thanks for having me. I had a good time. All right, right on. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Nato. All right. Oh, that was Nato Green. Um, and that was the episode for this week. Uh, does anybody have anything to plug before we get out of here? Uh, just come to uh, our weekly show, Airplane Mode, Cherry Tree Bar, 8 p.m. Follow me on ACAU Official. I got other shows. I'll post about them on Facebook or whatever. Just follow me there. Bye. Again, plug in paid protest this Saturday oh, at yeah, Mayday Space. Uh, 7 p.m. doors. We're going to do karaoke after. We're going to get fucking drunk. It's if you're in Bushwick, come out. It is is going to be great. Uh, we're Benefiting. raising money for the housing working group, DSA housing working group. Emmy, Emmy Blotnick will be there. Uh, Clara Kane will be there. It's going to be very, very good. I was trying to speak in unison as you, and I failed so badly. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't yeah, even yeah. close. Um, yeah, but you should come to our show either way. Uh, give us a high five, why don't you? Um, as for me, uh, this should be up tomorrow, tomorrow night, the 29th. I'll be at the tank at 8 p.m. doing an immigrant, uh, I'm sorry, doing a, doing a show for immigrant families, a, sh- a benefit for immigrant families. I'm not doing a show for the kids in the cages, although they probably need it more than anyone else. Um, I also have a couple other things <laughs> coming up. Um, fuck, I'm on Too Many Cooks, uh, one of the best shows in New York right now on September 5th at 8.30. Oh, I'm going to come watch that. And um, speaking of live shows, uh, d- thanks to uh, the listeners who came out to the show I did at El Cortez the other night. I opened for my pal's band. I had a really good time right before I blacked out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we got real <laughs> tore up. Uh, me, me and the crusty punks, uh, yeah. we're not good for Jake each other. Jake owns a big spiky dog now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that was really rad. Some people came out from fucking Jersey City to d- watch that show. So that Holy was shit. real cool. Uh, so thank you, you guys. All right. Uh, all the rest of my shows are on my pin tweet and all that stuff. And uh, as always, for bonus episodes, you got to type it in because we're not safe for work. 
patreon.com slash pod damn America. Um, if anyone's listening and doesn't know how uh, the, this works, I'm just going to periodically sort of put this information out there. Um, if you want to hear our bonus episodes, you sign up for five bucks on Patreon at patreon.com slash pod damn America. And then what will happen is you'll get a, a link to a RSS feed that you can put into your podcast app. And then you just get like the, the other feed, which is our, you know, our bonus episodes. Do um, it. It's cool. You'll feel like a hacker. Yeah, it's real cool. All right. Later, y'all.